Mm -hmm. Hi everyone, I'm Jim Croxton, CEO of Bigger, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this Continue to Learn Extra webinar. This is the first of at least eight webinars that we have scheduled over the summer months. Normally our webinars are aimed predominantly at Bigger members, but in recognition of the importance of this topic, we've widened this one out, and I'm grateful to our friends at the Golf Club Managers Association, UK Golf Federation, and England, Scotland and Wales Golf for promoting the webinar more widely. A big welcome to those of you that are joining us from other aspects of the industry. Thank you all for pre-registering and attending. Uh, the Q&A icon on your screen allows you to ask questions and also gives you the option to vote for the ones that you'd most like to hear the answer to. So please use that during the webinar. We've had lots of questions in already, a number of which will be covered by uh, the content of the webinar, but we'll do our best to answer all of the ones that come through, or at least the general themes around the ones that come through at the end of a session. This webinar covers the issue of managing the challenges presented by leather jackets, and the webinar we presented by Glenn Kirby, Technical Manager for Syngenta Turf and Landscape for the UK and Ireland. Prior to joining Syngenta, Glenn managed turf for over 25 years, working and studying in both Europe and the USA. He's managed clubs at both ends of the spectrum with large and small budgets and experience of delivering over 15 televised golf events. He was also one of the very first bigger members I met when I was first appointed CEO when I bumped into him at the London Club for Golf Live back in 2011. So Glenn, over to you. Thank you, Jim. You're very kind. Um, I remember that day. Uh, that, I think, was the uh, European Open at the London Club. And uh, good to see the London Club have just got another European Tour event. So well done, boys. Um, right, so I appreciate we have a wide audience with us today. So I'm going to take this and try and talk about the basics of this challenge. It might be very simple for some of you who are listening. Um, some of the content you may have heard before. I apologise for that, but I think it's worth going into the beginning of it. So welcome to all you golfers, professionals, club managers, turf managers, whoever has decided to join and listen to me today. Thank you very much. So Jim's absolutely right. I spent 25 years as a, a turf manager. I went through the career path of green keeping um, straight from school, went out onto the golf course, rate bunkers, did everything from day one and managed to get involved. And green keeping is incredibly close to my heart. And I think that's why I'm here today, really, is I really appreciate the challenge that a lot of the turf managers are out there are under and the pressures that are going on at the moment. And I want to try and share my insights into what's going on. I'm not an expert, but what I am is now someone who understands greenkeeping and I understand the chemistry industry and I understand the challenges on both sides of this. So I'm going to try and bring it all together so at least we can understand the basics, establish why we're here and hopefully have a bit of a roadmap for the path ahead. So I'm going to start with the goal. What is it we're all trying to achieve? And I don't care who's listening. I think it's fair to say we all have one goal, and that is to try and get that golf ball in the hole in as few shots as possible. Golfers want great putting surfaces and green keepers want to deliver great putting surfaces. We may not all agree on absolutely the same way on how to get those great putting surfaces, but we all want to deliver awesome surfaces. Whether you're a golfer, a greenkeeper, golfing body, whoever you are, putting surfaces is our objective. And they're being threatened. Uh, they're being threatened by crane fly or daddy long legs, as a lot of people will refer to them. This is a frustrating pest to the golf industry, and it is seemingly on an exponential increase at the moment. We are being significantly challenged. But we've always been challenged, um, but times are changing and it seems to be getting worse. So on the back of this presentation, I'm hoping you'll have a really clear understanding of why we're in this position. What are the driving factors behind this challenge? I want to share with you what I think are ways to manage this challenge better with the tools that we have available to us now and the things that we can do to shape what's on the horizon, those things that are coming at us. And so we'll start with the basics, a little bit of background. We have two species of crane fly in the UK that challenge and give us problems on a turf. We have the European crane fly and the marsh crane fly. They have two separate life cycles. The European crane fly has a 12 month life cycle that will hatch around October and it will spend around 48, 49 weeks of the year in the soil as a leather jacket feeding. It's a feeding machine. That's what it does year round. 
And the other one is the marsh crane fly that has a six month life cycle and that too will hatch around that October period, but it will stay in the ground until it gets around to about April time. Traditionally April, but it's variable year on year and we've got a little bit of data on that as well. And then that will hatch and it will lay eggs and those eggs will over summer through the soil and they will add to the challenge. Now, each one of those female crane flies can lay up to 400 eggs each. So you can see quite quickly with that very simple equation of one crane fly, 400 eggs, how that population can exponentially increase quickly without the right control measures in place. And we see huge populations of them in the soil. Um, we're seeing lots of them and seemingly an increasing amount. What we're seeing more and more is people having to sheet greens in this, in this spring period to get control. And now sheeting is a very effective way of reducing population numbers, but it's very labor intensive, it's disruptive to golf, and it's probably only feasible on greens and not wider areas. But what we see when people put these sheets out is we see huge numbers of them brought to the surface. They can then be mown, brushed, removed, whatever works. But what we do see in the bit that I find fascinating is the quantity that comes to the surface. Now, this gent has sent me a photo and he's decided to measure the amount he's pulling out in liters. So we can pull huge amounts out of the surface. But the bit that I find fascinating is we can go and sheet on a Monday and remove huge amounts. And then we can come back and do it again on Wednesday and continue to pull the same amounts out of the soil. There is a huge reserve of these things in that soil profile, and we have to put measures in place to keep reducing that population. Now, beware. People are chasing a zero tolerance to this now. We have really increased our understanding of this pest over recent months. We have accelerated all of our understanding, and people are now chasing a zero tolerance to leather jackets. That is not realistic under any chemistry, any management regime to have zero in the soil is not something you're ever going to achieve. So if you think you're going to chase that, you are going to give yourself mental breakdown chasing that dream. What we've got to look at more is we've got to look more towards what damage are they doing? And I'll touch on some of that a little bit later. So how big is this problem? How widespread is this problem? And how much is it impacting the industry? Is it just a few people on social media shouting from the rooftops about it? Or actually, is it a very widespread problem? One of the biggest problems we have here is that turf managers like to deal with things in a curative fashion. What I've got in front of you there is a September to August timescale. That's roughly the life cycle of the 12 month insects. They will lay in September and they will go through this whole period. And the period that we see the damage most, this isn't for everybody, for some people it could be spread out wider than this, but the biggest period of damage for most people is around March, April, May period, this period that we are in right now. And turf managers want a curative effective treatment for that. They want to go at something, they want to go when there is a problem, they want to be applying it now. Now, the challenge we have is the regulatory framework that dictates which products can be registered and what rates they can be registered at is very much driving the whole model of pesticide applications towards preventative treatments. They're doing everything they can to reduce active ingredient loading. Now, for those of you that aren't familiar with this, active ingredient is effectively the engine of a product. An active ingredient is the bit that does the job. The product is all the formulation around it and how it's bottled and to get the best out of that active ingredient. We've got to change our mindset from curative treatments to effective treatments if we're going to fall in the framework that is allowing products to be registered. The drive is to get us into a better position we, and use less product and use less active ingredient. That is the objective of the regulatory bodies. And I do believe we are going to come through this and out the other side with better surfaces, better understanding of this pest, better control of it, and a much more responsible approach to turf management than the one we had in the past. It's not going to be an easy journey but we will make that transition with time. 
recently we did a survey um we did this around january because i wanted to do it when it wasn't very emotive if we were to do a survey now it would be very emotive because lots of people were very concerned about this product and it's absolutely on everyone's radar at the moment but in january it wasn't such an emotive issue i've done a few of these surveys now in my time at syngenta and engagement with the industry is really tough to get a response to these kind of surveys you don't get huge engagement but to get 427, and they were quick, it was within hours of putting this survey out, we had the response that shows the level of the challenge within with the industry. People are really engaged in this. Now, the map that you can see is where all those responses came from. And it looks like they're concentrated around one area, but actually that's just a pretty good distribution map of golf courses around the UK. And what we asked them was what level of damage are you seeing? Really simple question. Number one, are you seeing no damage whatsoever? That's what we all want to be in. That's what we hope to achieve. Number two was minor bird pecking. That is probably a result of having very low populations and birds chasing those leather jackets. But they're still being there, but low populations. Now, for green keepers, it's a frustration. But actually, I suspect that is now a pretty good place to be in. Number three was spring damage. Now, what spring damage means is you have a high enough leather jacket population to be feeding and the turf isn't growing enough to outgrow the damage that is being done. Where you were number four, which is summer year long impact on putting surface. Now, what that means is your population is high enough and your growth isn't good enough to outgrow the damage being done. Or are you number five, where you have significant loss of turf? Now, significant loss of turf means we've got so far on that journey before grass growing starts in the spring, it never has a chance to recover. So these one to five was kind of a really useful spectrum to start monitoring where people were. And the results were fascinating. 1.4% uh, of people said they were seeing no damage. Now, in an industry where we have absolutely zero tolerance to any imperfections on our putting surfaces, I mean, 99% of course managers are out there fretting around this problem is very, very worrying. The turf issue worries me. The bigger issue for me is the state of the greenkeepers in the UK and the pressure they are being put under by golfers to deliver surfaces without the tools in their armory to provide what they need to do. That's my bigger concern. That's why I'm putting myself on this pedestal to talk about it and get things moving because this needs to be communicated. 99% of people were seeing these challenges. 27% of people were seeing some damage. They were seeing some bird pecking. That's probably a good place to be in, to be honest, um, with what we understand now. 40% were seeing this spring damage, 20% roughly were seeing this year long damage, and 11% were seeing significant loss of turf. They are a worrying set of numbers. And this problem can be broken down into quite a simple equation and I'm going to refer back to this a couple of times because we need to attack this from a number of different angles. We have turf growth. How fast is turf actually growing? What is the nutrition program? What state is the plant health in? What are the temperatures? Are they optimum for growing? What levels of stress are in place? How much can that grass grow? You then minus this next section of the equation, which is feeding times population. The feeding element of the insects, how hungry are they? How much are they feeding? What is that driven by? We've got to get a much better understanding of that area. What impact does temperature have? What is the optimum temperature range for them to be feeding in? What impact do aeration holes have on their, their feeding pattern? What impact does all of this have and how can we influence that in the future? If we times that by the population, the tools we had to deal with the population were very effective in the past. But we're going to talk a little bit later about why they are going to become more challenging to use and why we have less of them. But if we can't reduce the population as much, we have to look to see how we reduce the feeding. And if we get this ratio right, we can reduce the scale of the problem at the end of the year. Now, there's another driver in this as well, and that is climate. Um, we've all seen images like this of raising climate temperature, um, global maps, distribution of climate change. I'm not here to discuss climate change, CO2 emissions or anything like that. The bit I'm interested in is what are the actual temperatures that are being delivered to turf managers 
and what implications that they have in the way they manage their turf. Because in agriculture, this is a big, big problem. Insect pressure and climate change are significantly correlated. There's a uh, study that I read the other day looking at predicted um, distribution of insect yield losses if we do reach two degrees increase. They are predicting through this area of Europe, if we hit two degrees increase in temperature, 50 to 100% loss of wheat yields if we hit those temperatures. Insect challenge is huge. It's massively hitting the UK sugar beet industry. It is a big problem, not just for turf. So I said I was only really interested in the temperature implications to turf managers. And what I've done here is I've pulled out the data for November and December since 1984. So since 1984, you can see across that bottom axis all the years plotted there. And I've logged how many days each year we were above eight degrees through that 61 day period from the 1st of November to the end of December. And the reason I've done that is because that is the development phase of this insect. Through that period after they've hatched, this pre-Christmas period, that insect is feeding and feeding and feeding. And the more opportunity it has to feed and grow, the stronger, the more vigorous it is going into that spring. Now, actually, there's an interesting trend here. It isn't a trend for massive increase in temperatures, but there is a spike in the last five years. We have had some very high warm periods in the last five years, which is also correlated with our loss of control measures. So we're seeing a big increase through this autumn period in the development opportunities for these insects. If we look to the other end, the spring, when is the period when we're going to start to see the damage? What I've logged here is the number of days in April, so just a one month period, which is when I'm seeing most of the damage, the number of days where the temperature falls between one degree. Now, this is a pretty good indication of the amount of growth we're getting. So that first part of the equation, what opportunity do we have to outgrow the damage? And again, there's an interesting trend here, a trend for warming. We're seeing less days when we're below one degree, except this year. This year is an absolute brutal, April, but we have not seen before. 24 days where we reach one degree. Now this data was from Coventry, but I could pull this graph off from anywhere around the country and see very, very similar. So in a year where we've seen opportunities for the insect to develop more in the autumn, and we're waiting for growth in the spring to recover from it, we have been hit hard this year. So it's no wonder there's a lot of anxiety, there's a lot of stress, and there's a lot of worry in this industry about this challenge we don't have the tools to reduce the population and we are being hold, held at ransom by a cold spring. So if we look at that in the equation form, we had very low turf growth this spring because of how cold it is. We've had high levels of feeding because of the autumn temperatures. Population levels are high because we have low control methods equaling a high problem. Now I try and engage with as many people as I possibly can who have this challenge. I spend a lot of time on the phone talking to people about this. I must have a hundred WhatsApp groups on my phone where people send me photos of this problem. And generally everyone boils down to two requests. When we boil down what they're asking for, there are two things golf course managers want to help improve this situation. They want more communication with the golfer. Most people I speak to, a lot of the good course managers out there, they're all doing a great job communicating with their golfer. But they all feel like they need somebody else to support them. This is a problem that may happen on your golf course one year and disappear the following year. It could be at a golf course down the road one year and disappear. They feel they're being compared to other golf clubs. And it is unfair because the tools they have in their armory are just not available for them. We want to hear someone from a higher body communicating this message, saying, listen to your golf course manager if they're telling you this is a problem, because this is a challenge. The cold spring has amplified it this year, but it is a real problem. And generally, people want some more support on communication. And the other thing they want is more tools to deal with this problem. I think most people 
that I talk to are very understanding of the environmental factors and the reasons to reduce the amount of insecticide usage, but they want tools to allow them to do their job. And that's where we come in, you know, that's why I'm talking to people because that's the area of the industry I work in. So I'm quite comfortable when sharing with you the challenges we have bringing those tools to the market and what you can realistically expect. If you go onto the pesticide register, which is an open database on the, on the HSE website, you can see since 2006, we have had 1,260 insecticide withdrawal notices across agriculture turf. That is a frightening amount of insecticides that have disappeared. All along the bottom of the active ingredients you can see that have been removed. Um, they're the active ingredients. Remember, they are the engine of a uh, product. The product is then formulated in different ways by different companies. The arrow is pointing to chlorpyrifos. Chlorpyrifos is a product that you would have heard mentioned. There has been 120 withdrawals of that, and that is because that active ingredient has been withdrawn from Annex 1. So it gets withdrawn from Annex 1 and then it gets slowly removed from markets. Now we've parted from the EU now and we are out there on our own, but effectively that Annex 1 list, that list of active ingredients can be used, gets copy and pasted, and it now gets turned into the UK's statutory active substance register. So it is exactly the same list, just under a different title, housed by the UK. All of the regulatory framework has been copy and pasted over. We have an opportunity now to go in a slightly different direction if they so choose, but as far as I'm aware, everything is exactly the same now as it was then. We just have to drive any of these decisions through the UK. Now, chlorpyrifos and a lot of these other products have just been removed from that list. And what happens with that list is they are regularly reviewed and they are reviewed for any concerns to human health or the environment. So those endpoints, as they're known, the hurdles that we have to meet are regularly reviewed and every product is reviewed against them. And over time, they get lower and lower and lower and lower. And it's done to make these products safer and safer and safer for the environment, for humans, for everything that is going on. They're trying to drive us towards safer and safer products. They're removing the risk rather than using stewardship to manage the risk. Now, personally, and this is just my opinion, I'd love to see some more stewardship wrapped around products so we could have them longer, we could use them more. But actually, we haven't got the best example of stewardship historically. I think, honestly, if all the course managers look at themselves and are completely honest about whether they're sticking to label recommendations, reading labels and doing everything properly, I think we would all have to look hard at ourselves. So stewardship is not an option that they are giving us at the moment. We need to see these products. It's hard, you know, we're losing those products. So the way they're modeling things, they're modeling things for agriculture. They're modeling things to reduce population levels of all of these challenges. Whereas in golf, we have something different. In golf, in golf greens, we have a zero tolerance to damage in these areas. And that's very different to what people are expecting in agriculture. Agriculture is driving all of these models because it is big business. And we have very little influence as a golfing body. And what I've got in front of you here is a, um, a DEFRA survey where they look at the amount of insecticide used every year. And you can see from 1990 all the way through to 2016, I think this one goes, you can see this downward trend in insecticides, which is brilliant for the environment. It's great news. But what it means is insect populations will be on the rise. If you look at 2012 there, you can see in agriculture, 490,000 kilograms of insecticide were used. If we look to turf and golf, in that same year, we used 419 kilograms of active ingredient of product. If we put that into perspective, that is 0.85% of what was used. When the regulating bodies look at these and they make decisions based on any of this, they look at data. They are not emotion led, they are data led. The data that is submitted will drive the decisions they make. For less than 0.1% of the industry, 
we are not big enough to influence the regulatory framework for these products. And that information comes to them through the amenity survey. So there was another amenity survey recently, 2020. Um, all of this data goes in to help shape those decisions in the future. Again, ask yourself, did you see this amenity survey? Did you take the time to fill it in? That was your opportunity to have a voice. I don't know how many people filled it in. I suspect not very many. Look, this isn't just impacting us though. This is impacting agriculture too. We have less control and that means more insects. More insects means more pressure. If we go back to our equation and we start to look at the things that we can do in here then within the remit we've got, within the products that are available to us to start dealing with this challenge. We've got to deal with that problem. If we look at turf growth, we've got to look at everything we possibly can to improve plant health. We've got to look at fertility. We've got to look at biostimulants. We've got to look at drainage. We've got to look at cultural practices. Everything that is in our remit to put that plant in the strongest place possible to deal with this challenge is very, very important. We have to understand the feeding process of this insect much better. We don't really know much at the moment, if I'm honest. We've got to go on a huge learning curve here. We need some serious investment in research, looking at how they feed, why they feed, how we can reduce that. Because if we're going to struggle to reduce the population, then we're going to have to reduce the feeding. Can we do that with aeration? Is that having an impact? If we simply moved solid tine aeration to slit tine aeration, would that change their feeding habits? I don't know the answer to that question. As far as I know, no one's done any work to fully understand it. I suspect there's a correlation, but I don't know. What impact could we have with pH? Um, what pH is optimum for hatching and feeding? We don't know the answers to these questions. I don't know who's going to fund it either. I don't know where that's coming from, but it's important. These are the keys that are going to unlock the success of the future. And moisture. Moisture is a massive one. I've spoken to loads of entomologists about this and they all tell me the answer is really easy. We just make sure it's incredibly dry when they lay their eggs because their eggs are very prone to desiccation. The challenge with that is they're laying their eggs at a time of year where we have no control over moisture. They're laying in October. Nobody or very few people are irrigating through that period of the year. We're trying to manage putting surfaces. So there's some real challenges there, but there's some keys that could be unlocked to reduce that pressure. We've then got to move to the population part of the equation and we've got opportunities here. We do have tools to deal with things, but what we're not doing is understanding these population levels very well. We've got to do a better job of monitoring population levels, understanding how many of them are in our soils, understand the correlation of that against the damage they are doing. And we've got to start logging that and sharing it with each other to understand it. We can start monitoring these things around December they start reaching a stage at kind of end of November, beginning of December, that is large enough for us to see and monitor. We should be able to foresee a problem at that stage if we get some good monitoring practices in place. Once we know that, we've got a better chance of dealing with it. Um, but before we get to that stage, if we look at this preventative applications, we have got to make more effective use of the products that we have. We have limited products available, but the ones we do have available, we've got to make the very best of. We've got to make sure we apply them right. We've got to get the timings right on them. We need to use them at times that suit the products rather than times that you would like to apply them, that you would like them to work for you. Got to use tools effectively to drive that problem down. Now, whilst we're on tools, there's a few things we need to share. Um, new insecticide registrations are incredibly tough to achieve. They are very, very difficult. They require huge levels of data for submission and approval. That data gathering takes years to put together. They take in-depth studies. And when we submit things for registration, they need really strong data that takes time Celeprin as a product that we have in full registration, I believe we've been working on it, gathering the data, building that portfolio for around six years now. This isn't something that people missed. This is just something that takes a long time to do. 
all of that work is expensive. It's very expensive to get products registered for such a small market. To even develop those products in the first place, to develop a new insecticide costs around $300 million now and takes around 12 years to develop from scratch. So this isn't something we could just flick a switch and turn on tomorrow. These things take time. The list of existing active ingredients that we can go to, those ones on that substance list, is reducing as they keep reviewing and reviewing those human and environmental factors the number of active ingredients available get less and less and less and in turf we have a big issue we have operate we have exposure to humans we have golfers walking on golf greens we have them picking up golf balls we have all of those things going in so when an active ingredient is removed it's going to get removed from amenity first it will still go from agriculture, but it will go slower because they can manage that risk much better than we can in golf. So the list that we've got of active ingredients available to us is not only short now, but it's getting shorter in the future. So the list of products that we can even screen that are going to be viable in two, three, four years time is reducing all the time. And if we're going to invest money in trying to find a product that it can bring to market, we know there's no point doing it unless it's going to be with us for the foreseeable future. And all of those registration models where we have to submit that data, they are all built around agriculture. Agriculture is the big chunk of this business. We are less than 0.1%, so they are not building specific models for golf. Those models are all built around reducing pressure to tolerable levels. What we have in golf is where we want to try and zero we have zero tolerance so something needs to change either the regulatory model or people's expectations the regulatory model is going to be tough to change um, so if i can make some predictions on this um, any new insecticide that comes to market is amazing technology it may not be as effective as you wish it would be, but to meet all those safety endpoints, to not get washed through water, to still prove that it kills insects and actually get through registration is amazing chemistry. The fact that it even gets there is just almost a miracle. From that point, there's not gonna be many. Don't expect some miracle insecticide to turn up next week. They take a long time to develop they take a long time to gather the data. They take a long time to get registered. There's not many on the horizon. They will be more effective when applied preventatively. It's not to say they won't work curatively. They will have an impact, but they will be more effective when applied preventatively. The younger that insect is, the more juvenile it is, the better chance you've got of killing it. And they will be strictly limited in their number of applications. Everything is about reducing the amount of usage. There will be strong limitations on how many applications of these products that can be made in the future. Now, the reason I've gone to this slide, I'm personally not a big Formula One fan, but Dan, who I work with, is, and this is a great way of explaining the regulatory bodies and what we're trying to achieve as a company. Um, for those of you that are familiar, Roman Gosnan came out of this crash, he walked out of it. Now, Formula One regulating bodies are constantly reviewing the safety measures for those cars. They are tightening them, tightening, making them safer and safer and safer. Engineers are working harder and harder to ensure those cars still perform at the same level, but they are safer. We are the engineers here. We are trying to develop products that regulator and body, regulatory bodies are tightening down the safety hurdles on all the time. And in this example, they managed to achieve it. We are, but we're not investing that same level. We are struggling to develop products that are going to give you exactly what you need at the right time. That doesn't mean if we use them in a different way, we can't get really effective results, which is what we can. Look, new products that come to the market are going to struggle. They are going to find it a challenge to deal with this problem. And there's three main reasons for that. There are huge reserves of this insect in the soil. Now, if a product gets registered, we have to prove that it, can, it is not mobile and has any chance of reaching water. So it needs to get locked up in that soil really quickly. The challenge with leather jackets, as we've seen from the sheeting example, is there is a huge depth of them. There is a reservoir of these in the soil and we will not be reaching them with these products because if a product moves through the soil quickly, then there's no way it's going to get registered. 
Number two, they move. So even if we get really effective control and zero for population out in the treated area, you only got to look at the top of these sheets where I've done some monitoring to see all the trails of those leather jackets over the top of it in one night. They move a huge difference. So if we zero the population out in one area, recognize that the areas outside have leopard jackets in them still and they can easily migrate back in there. So we need to look at treating larger areas to give us more effective control. I tried to learn exactly how far they would travel by collecting them and putting them in a strip of guttering. I have a piece of guttering that's laid out in my garden that I race leather jackets down. Yes, my kids think I'm a weirdo. The problem was they escaped that thing. They move so quickly up and out of these surfaces, they disappear quick. From the few that I did actually manage to keep in there, I reckon they are very capable of moving 10 meters a night. And when we look at that problem, we realize how big an issue migration is. The next challenge that any product is gonna have is they're gonna be very effective on juvenile insects, but not very effective on the mature ones. And that is the way the framework is set up to set up minimum dose rates so that we're effective on juvenile insects. When we look at pest tracker data, a lot of you will be familiar with pest tracker data. Pest tracker is a system that we use in the UK. Thank you to all of you who contribute. You let us know when you're seeing crane fly flying so we have an idea of the best time to apply insecticides to get the best out of them. And you can see there are very obvious peaks at times of the year. Keep reporting that data. I'm expecting a bit of a hatch anytime soon. Um, but you can also see during the periods of trough, we continue to get sightings. We continue to see them hatch. Now they are hatching over around an eight month period. There isn't really a time in there where they stop hatching and laying. There's definite peaks, but we're seeing them year round. And that leads to this phenomenon. We get a wide range of ages in the soil. Now, when we've got products that are only effective on the very juvenile insect, there is only a percentage of the population it's going to take out. So we're only reducing a percentage of the population. We can't get deep in the soil. We have some real issues here. And then we get things moving from outside. Now, we can feed all of that back to the regulatory bodies and explain what's going on. But this is the model they are asking us to adopt. They are asking us to make sure we maximise our cultural control we maximize our physical and mechanical controls. We do monitoring and modeling. Um, we do biological work and we do, sorry, I'm doing it. Um, biological work and chemistry. And we use all of those tools before we go back. We've got to make the most of all of those. As an industry, we have relied on chemistry to solve our problems. So if we go back to what we got going on in the equation, we need to reduce that population. We need to up that growth. And we can reduce that problem. Now, I'm going to take you through how we can build that plan quickly. It's quite loose. I'm not going to go into it in too much depth because I just haven't got time today. But for me, effective control needs planning. We need to document how we're going to put this together. We need to think about the control options we have available to us and we need to put a plan together to get the very best out of it. In order to communicate this with the golfer, we need to document and share things with them. They need to see what we're doing. The golfer will not want to believe that this is a challenge. They won't want to believe that more work is going to go in and the quality of their greens is going to be lower. But we have to present them with the data. And if at the end of all of this process, we still can't deliver the putting surfaces we want, and we all want great putting surfaces, we have to present data to the regulatory framework to prove that these measures aren't enough. We can't just go to them and say, you know what, it's not working. We're gonna to have to justify it. So to have any chance of changing those models in the future about how products are registered, we're going to need to present some data. And I'm gonna share with you how we do that. But the thing that's most important is we write this down. Look, before you start, this first, first part of this process is assessing your risk. Regulatory bodies are not going to want products applied if you're in a low risk situation. So we need to assess that and what can you do? 
the first question I would ask yourself is what damage did you see? Not what levels of leather jackets did you see, but what damage? Where did you fit on that spectrum? Are you a one, a two, a three, a four, or a five? And what damage did you see? Now, this is a method that I would suggest you all engage with. Buy yourself a hula hoop, give it to a member, and ask them to assess your greens on a regular basis. Break that hula hoop 10 times randomly on a green and then measure the amount of damage in each area. Log it and then you have a quantifiable number that you can associate with the damage. Ask yourself, have you seen them before? If you've not seen leather jackets, do not panic. They tend to go back to similar sites. What did your monitoring tell you? Now, I'm going to touch on this now. Monitoring is a really good way of levering, of measuring what leather jackets are in that soil. Use a one square meter sheet. Now, what I do is I go onto the internet and I buy these one meter tarps. I get them custom made, get some eyelets in the, on the sides and they cost about five pounds each. They're very, very cheap. Get some made up. Place them out around the golf course. Wait until you've got temperatures of around four degrees overnight as a minimum. Move them around, record that data, do it on the greens, off the greens, wide areas to understand the scale of the challenge you have. And you can probably start doing this around the end of November because that's when you can start to see them. Then log what the climate is like in your region. Whereabouts in the country are you? And what you can see here is a thermal imaging camera of a leather jacket on a glove. Now you can't see it at the moment because it's the same temperature as the glove. I've picked it up, I've put it in my hand and I've warmed it up for a few seconds. And you can see when I put that back down, how the temperature has changed of that glove. They are very driven by temperature. So the warmer a climate you are in, the more challenges you're gonna have. And if we look at that survey, the significant losses that were reported in that survey that 11% of people were all around the south coast in the milder regions of the country. And if we look at those November, November mean temperatures from last year, we see those areas are more prone to risk. I did a user trial with nine golf courses this year. We looked at some in-depth timing changes. We looked at various methods out of the nine places we did the trials only three of those golf courses reported any damage. The three that reported damage were the ones in the warmer climates. And what are courses local to you seeing? Talk to other golf courses, associate the risk locally, talk to what they're, them about what they're doing, that all contributes towards your risk factor. Then I'd like you to go on to the control methods that are available to you. Have a look at all the tools that are in your armory. One tool isn't going to do it. You're going to need more tools now. So a celeprin is something that we work with. It's the one that I'm really focused on. We should get, fingers crossed, our fourth emergency authorization this year. All the golfing bodies have really got behind this. To get four emergency authorizations is amazing. It's almost unheard of. A full registration has been applied for. Again, fingers crossed we'll get that and we'll get that soon. But we never know when that's going to come until it lands on our doorstep. Some places haven't adopted this emergency authorization. If we look to Guernsey, they didn't adopt the emergency authorization. And if you look at the condition of greens over there through this period, you will understand why this was a big step forward. Um, it may not be enough for everybody, but it's a huge step forward. We need to use this properly at the right time of the year. And then you need to look down through that list at all the other tools that are available to you. Look to nematodes, look to cultural controls, list them all in a document. Then you want to look to timing. When you've got a control measure, write down the optimum timing. Not the optimum timing for you, but the optimum timing for that product. Then associate a cost with it. Now, at this point, you want to start sharing that with people in your club so they understand how much they want to invest to try and avoid this problem. Write down the number of applications that are available to you. How many times can you use these products? And then you can start building your plan. You can also start building trigger models. You will apply this if you hit certain levels of numbers and monitoring or certain levels of damage. I then suggest you ask for the data for all of these products. Now, if you come to me and ask for data on a seller print, I can share a load of trials with you where we've shown high levels of control 
and that all helps you build your picture about which products to justify spending your budget on. Ask for peer feedback, talk to other golf courses, other people find out how they've got on with stuff as well. And then make notes on how to get the very best out of this. We did a survey of 99 golf course managers who'd used our product. On the product, it clearly stated minimum 600 litres a hectare as a water application. When we surveyed them, 39% of people had gone at 600 to 50. So great, but they were going at that minimum level. They weren't going above the minimum level. Only 20% of people went above and made the extra effort to above 600. 40% of people were didn't even read it, stayed below it, didn't take any notice. You've got to make the most of the technology you've got available. You have one application of this, take the time to apply it properly. Think about water volumes, write down the optimum soil temperatures with nematodes. You've got to get those absolutely right. So understand soil temperatures, understand tank mix partners, understand all of those bits, make notes, log it all. And go back to your monitoring. If you've asked that guy to go out and monitor your numbers for you, you've got a pretty clear idea. Get them to report it. Report it back to Greens committees. Report it back to someone in your club. Make a point of logging where you are. Because if you can see you've got high numbers in November, highly likely you are going to have a problem in March and April. If you've got low numbers, you can probably back off the programme. But we've got to get in control early whilst these insects are juvenile. And then log your damage. Once we've got this and we've got some records of numbers that correlate against damage, we can start learning how we deal with this issue. But we need that data. And that data will come from recording it. Telling me you've got loads of damage isn't very helpful. Telling me you're seeing roughly four pieces of damage per square meter is useful data. Data that the regulatory bodies would look at and read. Look, I'm pretty close to the end. Um, so in summary, when I first started on this journey, I wanted to move people from a five to a one. That was what I was hoping for. As I spend more time looking at it, I think we need to be realistic. And if you're a two, with good practice, we can get you down to a one. If you're a three, we can get you to a two and so on. And with time and as we get better, we may be able to jump two steps. But this is a long journey and it isn't going to happen quickly. Look, I set, out, I set out with the mission of hoping to explain why we're in this position, what the driving factors behind this challenge were, and how we can better manage with the tools we've got and what we can do to shape the future. You know, we're in this position because we have less chemistry and we have higher levels of climatic impact. And the driving factors behind these are definitely climate, reduced insecticides used around us, reduced insecticide availability, tougher to get them registered. We do have tools that are available. Hopefully we can switch to a preventative mindset, which is going to really, really help. we we'll get on top of the problem early. And to shape the future, we need data. If we want to challenge everything, anything, then we need to have data. Now, I suspect if we put those measures in place, for most people, it's going to be enough to get us through. But if it's not, then we'll have data to support. It has to support you in your job and it will support us challenging. Look, I want to leave you with three things without a curative control, which I don't think we're ever going to get again. Anxiety levels for golf course managers is going to go through the roof. They are going to be worried. If they haven't got a product they can reach to when they're in dangerous situations, they get worried, they get nervous, they fear for their jobs. Please, as a wider industry, we need to understand this challenge and give them some help, not put additional pressure on them. This is not just a golf problem, this is a wider problem. The climate is changing, the tools are reducing, the regulatory framework isn't matching the climatic challenges. We have got problems on the horizon here. We need everyone to pull together on this. Golfers, greenkeepers, golfing bodies, this is a brutal journey, but it will be the right one. You know, We need to communicate with golfers and explain the challenges ahead. We need research to understand the impact of all these things. People need to understand the pressure that goes into getting these products registered. Chemical companies need to invest. Research needs to be committed. We will get through this. And when we do, we'll be pleased. <laughs> Plan and share your strategy. Look, get on top of that problem early. Recognize there's no miracle product on the horizon 
and we'll do the best that we can. Look, we're at the beginning of this journey. Together, we'll get through it. We've got some pain on the way. Hopefully, the biggest win would just be some warmer springs so we can go into recovery earlier. We will look back at this in five years' time and be very proud of what we've achieved. We'll be in a much better place environmentally. We'll be much more knowledgeable. It's going to be hard work, though. I've tried to rush through a lot there and I think I've overrun a little bit, very sorry, but if you want more of my kind of meanderings, I do a blog with loads of this, Greencast Advisory, log this stuff on Pest Tracker when you're seeing them. I do two podcasts, one which are very short bite-sized bits and one which is about an hour long where myself and Henry from ICL go into this kind of thing in depth every month. Please engage with us, talk to me, let me know what's going on and if there's anything I can do, please shout. Jim, over to you. Thanks, Glenn. <clears throat> As expected, excellent, uh, very informative, and of course, um, pretty distressing uh, because well, we don't have a, a silver bullet. What we do have is a, is a heck of a lot of questions. Um, I, I think we're approaching 50 questions in total from those that were pre-sent uh, and those that we picked up during the, uh, the session itself. Um, I'm going to try and group them as much as we can. Uh, I know that uh, you committed to us that we would endeavour to answer everybody one way or another in some kind of text format after. So if we don't get that question, we will at the very least come back, acknowledge your question and give you some thoughts around it. But I'm going to try and hit on a couple of the themes. I'm just going to pick up um, the first one to start with. There's been a number of questions around um, the situation, its position within the golf industry, communications in general. Um, and I'm just going to talk a little bit. I, I sent out a note to all of our members, I think yesterday, but um, that, that's the sort of the culmination of quite a piece of work. Um, we are, as an association, actively engaged with the rest of the golf industry, and that, that's everything from club managers through home unions and RNA um, and, and the wider industry um, that, that is involved in the supply side of our industry, not just yourselves at Syngenta on this topic. Um, we, we, we know it's a massive challenge for our members, and therefore it's something we want to address. We can't um, fix it on our own. Uh, we have been, we've had great support and commitment from all the rest of the industry. They recognise the scale of this challenge and they are prepared to help. Um, in the next few days, we're issuing a white paper uh, to within the golf industry, um, uh, which which covers a, a fair bit of what Glenn's has covered, but it, but also a little bit more in terms of some of the broader detail, a little bit more about why we are where we, where we are and what our options are. And there will be a kind of call to arms at the end of that. And there are probably four specific areas where we believe action is required and I think we as, as greenkeepers and as an association have a role to play in a couple of those and Glenn's been through those um, today monitoring um, and stewardship um, and those two those are two things that we're going to have to do better uh, as an association help you with the tools in, in, to do those uh, but we're going to have to do better at golf club level as well the other two things are things that I think the wider industry have a role to play in. One of those is research. Glenn's pointed out a number of areas today where we don't yet have the data on this um, on this sort of newish challenge, um, and we need some research done and, and we need some funding for that. And the communication that we've talked about, and, and the key thing here is communicating to golfers and managing expectations is something that, whilst I believe there's a role for our members and our association, because you are on the ground, with your golfers and there's, there's an opportunity there. We've got our posters, we've got our documentations, our articles, whatever. We need this to come from above as well. It needs to come down from the media uh, and from the golf authorities. I'm pleased with how this is going. There was golf media on this webinar. Uh, we've had the national press in the last couple of days. We had the Daily Telegraph. We had <clears throat> the Sunday Post in Scotland at the weekend. I know it's going to be more prevalent in the golf media. Um, and I think, uh, Glenn, you and I have discussed this before, but one of these key issues, one of the key phrases you use a number of times in that, that webinar is this idea of tolerable control. And tolerable control is something that is a new concept, I think, to golfers in particular. It's pretty new to us in this industry, but it's a very new co concept to golfers. And it is something that we're going to have to get across because this is not just insecticides. This is going to be an issue as well in terms of, of, of fungicides and other things as, as time goes on. So bigger is to be involved in this uh, we're doing a great deal you'll see more and more of that as we go along but i do think it's something as you said at the end of your presentation there glenn that the whole industry has to have a role in and i'm very confident that they will step up to that plate in terms of the other questions i've grouped them into certain areas i'll, I'll just that, that this is no it's kind of a random order depending on how they came in starting with them um, with the cultural control i'm just interested in your thoughts on on two things um one is is that obviously the sheeting 
um, that you talked about at, at some distance is disruptive. I mean, this can this can influence play. So any thoughts on how we as an industry perhaps um, publicize that and help our members explain that to their uh, to their authorities? And then a secondary question, just is there any are there any potential symptoms or downsides of this? One question's come in about could the sheeting, for example, cause any fungal activity um, that might be a, a byproduct of actually of actually doing this work? Um, so, yes, yeah, sheeting is not desirable. Um, if we can find other options, then I suspect we should be going to them. Um, I guess people are being driven to sheeting because that's the option they have available to them. How can they sell it to their golfers? Better communication. Um, we can talk more about this challenge and try and get the message out. Um, but it's a tough one. And, you know, I do appreciate the problems with that. Um, I would rather we had some really strong stewardship and have other products, but it's just not permitted. Um, is it going to cause other problems? <laughs> Potentially, yes. I know in football we see challenges when they're sheeting through the winter to remove frost or avoid frost. But during the April period, sheeting for a kind of 24 hour period or overnight, I don't think is going to cause any undue levels of disease. Um, you would have to be pretty unlucky to be caught out and have to put any different measures in place. But during the April period, when it's effective to be sheeting, I don't think it would cause any additional problems. Thanks, Glenn. We, we've had a, a number of uh, questions, all with various um, sort of technical questions on, on additional controls, biological controls, uh, some products I've not heard of, one that I think might just be a test of my, of my Latin skills, so I, I won't read it out right just now, but what we will do is perhaps um, gather some thoughts on all of these various issues, um, all, the, all these various options uh, for control. Some of the things that have been mentioned here, Chittasan, Diatomus, Earth, um, we'll, come, we'll come to nematodes shortly, um, sugar-based um, products, um, and the one that I was struggling to, to um, pronounce is um, uh, it's disappeared. Bacillus thermogenesis Israelis which I have to confess I haven't heard of. Does anything on there strike you just quickly to respond back to, or we'll try and, we'll try and put it into, into kind of paper form? Uh, look, we can try and summarise some of that stuff in the paper, but uh, we're screening a lot of products. We are predominantly a chemistry company. That's where we work. So my involvement is there. I'm going to be honest and say, I'm not an expert in this. What I am is quite central, and I can see both sides of the coin. Um, hence why I put my head on the parapet. I am not an expert that is screening hundreds of products on a regular basis. I get feedback from people and there is some words of caution there. This is such an intermittent problem that can appear one year on a golf course and then disappear and then come back the next. It's easy to think you've got success with a product when actually it's just luck of the draw. Um, pulling trial data together on any of these things is really difficult and it needs people to invest. So people who've got these products in their armory um, companies need to invest in looking and developing these products for the future. I'm hoping that there are some really successful ones that are in my team screening that are going to get to me sooner rather than later. Thank you. Um, quite a few questions around around cultural controls. Um, uh, and I'm just sorry, so not cultural controls, but in terms of some of the causes here. One question I know that you were interested in was this idea: Did do we believe that maybe lockdown or some of the uh, additional aeration practices that took place over the last six months have perhaps contributed to this? Um, I think the biggest contributing factor we've seen is this cold spring. I think that is number one. Um, lockdown, I do think, possibly had an impact, and it's something I'd like to see more in research in. I suspect people's mowing patterns changed. And when we're looking at sheeting, what's happening with sheeting is we're tricking those insects into thinking it's nighttime still. And then therefore they are still moving around the surface. We pull the sheets back and then we mow across there to remove as many as possible. Some of them will escape back down into the soil. Some of them will have never come up in the first place. I suspect there's a lot of those wandering around in the early mornings anyway. So when we're mowing early mornings and we're pressured by golf, 
we are physically doing a job removing those things. When we went into lockdown, what happened is all of our mowing patterns changed. People used the opportunity to grab that extra half hour in bed that they deserved for so many years rather than setting the alarm for 4.30 again. And we probably missed a few. So maybe populations increase there. That's me guessing there's no data that I can see or anybody investing in the research to back that theory up. But I think there's opportunities to mow in the dark for those courses where it can happen that maybe will reduce population levels. Um, I can't remember what the other question you asked me was, Jim. <laughs> I'm not sure I can. No, uh, yeah. um, I think it was more to, it was to do with, you know, the in, in, increased aeration, I think. is a, a... Uh, yeah, Increased aeration. No, I think what happens, so you've got these insects that are migrating around. Let's assume that we have zeroed out the population in an area on a golf green, but then we get things that keep wandering in because they are migratory by their nature, they can move. If they find an environment where there is a really nice elevator shaft on a well-drained green that is dry, that is all the things that we're trying to manage in a golf green, why would they ever move away from that? So I suspect what we kind of create is this environment where things can wander in and we've got such a great habitat, there is no reason for them to move back in or move back out. So we create this perfect environment for them to live in where they can dive down deep through these verti drain holes. They can go to nice warm soil temperatures through the cool, through the cool periods. They can come back up and they can feed on that turf. So they get grass growth, uh, green grass to eat. It's a perfect environment for them. Now, again, that's theory. I'd love to see somebody, even you could do this on your own golf courses, just commit to not aerating half of a green and see what impact that has. It will definitely change the way that that damage manifests itself. I suspect it would make your life easier to maintain a putting surface. Whether it would impact the population, I don't know. It's a fascinating study and one I would love to happen. I'm not sure I can justify our internal resources to fund those kind of trials as much as I keep asking somebody needs to do that stuff and i'm not sure that's our role yeah um there's been a few questions glenn and you've you've answered this to an extent during the presentation but around old chemistry um asking whether or not we feel there's any circumstances in which access to things like chlorpyrifos may come again now you you aren't a regulator um and so you know i'm only i guess i'm only asking for your gut feel on this um and a, a sort of supplementary question is whether or not the fact that we're uh, no longer in europe whether or not that might change um uh you know our, our tolerance levels over here what, what are your thoughts okay so there has been historically in agriculture times when products have been bought back from the past under emergency authorizations I suspect anything that was removed from that original list, such as chlorpyrifos, that was removed for human safety endpoints, I suspect that would never get reintroduced. Now, the ones that have been reintroduced were neonicotinoids under emergency authorizations, and they were removed not for human safety issues, but for environmental issues, as far as I understand. You are absolutely right. I'm not a regulator, I'm not a member of the regulatory team. So they need checking out, but I'm pretty sure that's the case. Now, when they were reintroduced, they were reintroduced with a whole load of stewardship to mitigate the environmental risk. So it was things like it can't be applied to the foliage. It has to be a seed treatment. Um, it has to only be applied at a certain time of year when bees wouldn't be foraging. They would have to be applied and then no flowering crop would be allowed in that field for the next number of years. It would then be triggered by a model as to whether the insect that they were trying to target was a pest. So things have been brought back historically under a whole load of stewardship, but I doubt you will ever see a product brought back under a derogation or an emergency authorization that was removed for human safety issues. Thank you for that. I mean, I, certainly um, as things stand, in order for us to even begin to make a case, we need a heck of a lot more data and, and modeling than we've got. Uh, right now, um, we, we were able to present a case that uh, for the emergency authorization of Celeprin that there was an economic challenge, um, but that was a, a, a chemical, if you like, that was that would 
you know, would pass current um, regulatory hurdles. So there's, there, um, there's the subtle difference there, Jim. What we're talking about with the seller and emergency authorizations is a product from the future, so it meets future regulations rather than historic ones coming back. And what we've got to then do is prove to have any chance of getting that next emergency authorization, we have to prove we're using the current technology as effectively as we can. And we'll need case studies and data to support anything in the future. And that's where people can engage. Absolutely. Um, we haven't really discussed nematodes at any length. I would say from our perspective that we are engaging with, with the companies involved in supplying of those. Uh, I know that there is uh, that, that I know that there are a number of facilities that have that have seen uh, substantial results using those. I also know that um, uh, just the same as with chemistry, um, there the ambition of using those is is to is to reduce um, the incidence and to find a level of what you might consider to be tolerable control. Uh, again, I'm not I'm not entirely sure it's fair to ask your opinion um, on on uh, nematodes, other than to say that we are absolutely will, will form part of all the information that we will provide. Um, and we'll do our best to answer the various questions that have come in on that. Yeah, I think I'm happy to comment on them. Um, I think knowing what I know now about the leather jacket challenge, I think people's expectations of them historically was too high. I think this is all about knocking a chunk out of that population. And what people have expected is to apply a product and it to solve all their problems. I don't think that's fair. What I also know about nematodes is that we have to get things right. We have to get them on at the right time. We have to apply them the right way. And then we have to manage our expectations. Now, you've got to analyze the costs of that and whether it's worth the risk. And that's all part of that documentation. But even if you decide not to use them, at least analyze the costs. We've done a little bit of work just to make sure there's no detrimental impact between the two products. And as long as there's a gap, we've seen no issues with applying the two and their impacts. They don't work against each other in any way. I absolutely think they're part of programs, but I'm not an expert in them. Go and talk to the guy who knows the stuff. Absolutely right. Uh, we have had just one question come in, which is absolutely the question for the technical manager of Syngenta. So assuming the facts are favorable for the application of a celeprin, um, would you recommend mixing a penetrant or retentive type wetting agent to increase efficacy? Okay, so, um we've done quite a few trials on this as we would because this is our product so this is an area where we have invested our money to get the best out of it we have seen no improvement in efficacy by adding a penetrant or a surfactant to it but we have seen no downside either so there is value in adding it if you're applying it to a hydrophobic situation my advice would be to get control of that hydrophobic soil before you apply it and then you can apply it in its best way afterwards but there is no downside to it but there's no data to say that it would make it any better okie dokie good well, thank you, that Glenn. Anything else you want to add before we um, before we wrap up? No, I think there's some great questions. I've just kind of flicked over to my other screen and had a look at all of the bits and pieces coming in. Um, uh, it'd be great to pull all of those together, summarise them, like you say, and answer them in a document. And I'll share that with Bigger and stick it on my blog, and we'll get that out there. But that's great. I, you know, I just hope people recognise there are some real challenges in there. The way that we can step forward is by being positive and working together and sharing this. If you need my help in any way, shape or form, get in touch. Um, hopefully we can move this forward as a group. OK, well, thanks, Len, And thanks, everyone, for all the questions before and during the webinar. I hope everyone's enjoyed it. Uh, or, the, or it's not necessarily a webinar to enjoy, but to, but to learn from. Uh, but I certainly found it informative, um, and as I said, a little distressing. Um, a certificate of attendance showing your CPD code is available on completion of a short feedback survey, which you should see on your screen as you exit this webinar. We'd really appreciate you taking a couple of minutes to complete the feedback to help us continue to deliver webinars that you'd like to attend. Um, this webinar will soon be available to watch on demand on the bigger website. Um, it is going to be available for anyone to view, not behind the members paywall. It will also be available on some other organisations' websites for their members as well. For example, the Golf Club Managers Association, the PGA. Um, our next webinar is entitled, a very different topic, a bulletproof system to hiring the right candidate. It will take place on Tuesday the 27th of May at 4 p.m. Pre-registration is open now via the What's On page of the bigger website, where you can also find details of all our future webinars. So uh, just finally, thank you all for joining us, and we look forward to welcoming you back again soon. Thank you.